Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. I've heard a lot of chatter within the chasing community in recent days that May is dead, uh, that we're not going to see robust severe weather for the remainder of May, and that simply is not true. We've moved into a portion of the season I like to call mesoscale uh, season. These events that rely on much smaller scale features or mesoscale features to produce severe weather. For example, outflow boundaries left over from a previous day's convection. Mesoscale convective vortices or MCVs left over from a previous night's storm complex. Um, very subtle perturbations in the flow aloft. Um, and these are going to be fueling the severe weather threat for the upcoming days. And this, t this portion of the season always tends to show up around this time. Perhaps it goes a little bit into June, perhaps a little bit earlier into May. But we always seem to get into this uh, portion of the season this, uh, that is fueled by these more mesoscale or smaller scale events. And that is what we're entering into now. So because I've seen a lot of this chatter that May is dead, I wanted to do a quick video on why that is not the case. Take a look at some of the forecasts for the upcoming days of severe weather and look at uh, a, an example case from the past uh, that shows just what can happen in this more mesoscale uh, event type of pattern. Uh, before we start, I wanted to thank everybody for being patient with the channel and the relative lack of uploads recently. I've been out on the road, as you may know, uh, on in my role as a tour guide for a tornado tour company. Um, so I just don't have a lot of time to really pump out these uploads. I've really tried to uh, confine the uploads to forecast discussions for the bigger days. Uh, and that is going to continue for this foreseeable future, uh, just because I will be through, uh, be still out on tour through the end of June. Uh, after, after that, we will get back into a more regular upload schedule, more some more case studies, uh, etc. So thanks for being patient with the channel. Uh, tried to post uh, updates when I can on these severe weather days in the community tab of the uh, YouTube channel here, as well as on the social media accounts for Convective Chronicles. So um, keep uh, an eye on those for more daily updates, uh, but the videos are going to be a little bit more sparse here, uh, continuing into uh, the rest of uh, May and into June. So let's go ahead and get started. As you can see here from the SPC, May certainly is not dead based on the SPC outlooks here. Slight risk for today, Monday, May 22nd. Slight risk for tomorrow as well. And a marginal risk for day three. And likely uh, more severe risks will be added for the day four through eight period uh, as it approaches. So we have several days of severe weather coming up. But if you were to take a more broad scale view as a lot of folks have here in recent days, you would think, well, severe weather is probably going to shut down for the foreseeable future and May is quote unquote dead. Well, that's just not the case, but let's take a look at why you might think that if you were to look at a more broad scale view of the atmosphere. So we're going to use the GFS model just for simplicity's sake here. We're only going to look at the operational GFS run. Of course, this is one model run, but it gives a good picture of why severe weather season has generally slowed down at least a little bit from our more active stretch in March into April. In March and April, we had a very, very active stretch, especially March, uh, where we had lots of these big, deep digging storm systems uh, dig down into the western half of the US and produce and really prime the atmosphere for significant severe weather activity, significant tornado activity uh, for that early portion of the season. Well, that has gone away and we are in that more, that portion of the season where we're, going, we're not going to see those real deep digging troughs um, for this upcoming stretch. And we'll show you here as we go through the 500 millibar pattern on the latest GFS. This is the 6Z GFS from May 22nd. So uh, the most recent run as we record this video on Monday, May 22nd in the morning. So if you were to take a broad scale view of what's going on right now, you'd think, well, that not much is going on across the country at all. We see a trough here up in the Pacific Northwest uh, that caused some severe weather yesterday in Oregon into Idaho. Big old trough here well off the northeast U.S. coast, off of the screen there. You see that, uh, just the remnants of it here on the north or on the uh, top right there of the screen. But otherwise, fairly strong ridging in place here up into Canada across much of the central plains. A little much, much more zonal flow here across the southern portion of the country. Little, some perturbations in here. Uh, and some slightly stronger flow centered across Texas into the Gulf Coast states here. Marginal severe threat out there today because of that. But overall, not a very uh, robust look for severe weather if you were to take this more broad scale view. And that continues into the foreseeable future. This, this zonal flow across the southern portion of the country stays. We, we have this ridging 
uh, really stay put across the country. Very quiescent flow across the northern portion of the country as well. You know, five, ten knots of flow there aloft here at 500 millibars. Um, pretty much from Kansas, Colorado, Missouri, northward into the northern plains. This trough in the north e northwest ejects off into Canada. And we maintain that very weak flow, a little bit stronger flow here across the southern plains. And that comes into play with these more mesoscale type events. I'll, I'll go into that more in just a second. But we'll continue on with time. And then we set up into the buzzword of this May. And that has been the Omega Block. The Omega Block is simply a description of this type of pattern where you have a strong ridge of high pressure centered in between two troughs. You see a trough here across the western half of the country, trough here out on the northeast coast with a big old ridge of high pressure in between. It's named Omega Block because of its resemblance to the Greek letter Omega. So that Omega Block is going to come back into play a little bit as we go into the last week of May. Uh, but we, you can see, still see here into the west coast we have this trough sitting here and we have a little bit stronger flow making it into the high plains there new mexico west texas eastern colorado now, that high central to southern high plains area i'm still seeing a little bit of enhanced flow aloft and again that is going to help out can help make that those daily rounds of severe storms a likelihood as we go into the next week or so even though we have this omega block in place uh, so you, if you were to just take a very superficial look at this um, forecast, you'd think, well, there's not going to be any severe weather at all with this strong ridge of high, pre high pressure in place. That simply just is not the case. Another issue with the upcoming forecast is this cutoff low that develops out here across the southeast. Uh, this it results from this old trough that we had out across the uh, east coast and northeast coast there, big old trough. That extended all the way down here into the southeast. That piece breaks off here in and floats back and retrogrades even a little bit there into the southeast. So we have this strong uh, cutoff low pressure area centered across Alabama, Georgia. That is problematic in general for moisture return across the plains. You can see that cutoff low extends down into the low to mid levels of the atmosphere. Here's at 850 millibars. You see that low centered out here across the Georgia, South Carolina coast. And what is on the backside of that flow, of that low northerly flow? When you have that northerly or offshore flow, that pushes the moisture out and shunts it out into the Gulf and really prohibits moisture return, uh, really robust moisture return from making its way into the plains, Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas. But that's not really the case here out in the high plains. We still have a corridor of moisture, that east, southeasterly to southerly flow here trying to bring that moisture and help maintain that moisture out across the western periphery of the ridge of high pressure. And that is why we're going to have a very pretty much daily setup of a dry line out here across the central to southern high plains. Uh, and we will maintain that moisture in this region for a daily threat of thunderstorms. We'll see here in our uh, dew point map. It's not going to be the most robust moisture in the world. You see it's it's kind of mid to upper 50s at this point for today. Going into tomorrow, we try to get those 60s dew points up into that region. Uh, and that's going to really stick around over the next uh, few days, that, that plume of 60s, upper 50s, all the way up into Colorado and northern Kansas there. But you can see that doesn't really go anywhere over the next few days. We have this nice plume of moisture out here on the western periphery of that ridge of high pressure because we just uh, barely maintain that corridor of southeasterly or southerly flow up into South Texas, up into the western Texas, and eastern New Mexico region, into those southern high plains uh, vicinity. So we do have that moisture in place, although it won't be the most robust. We're not going to see those you know, upper 60s, low 70s dew points that we might see if we had a big old trough coming in, big old surface response there, really pulling that gulf moisture northward. You can see that all that Gulf moisture and all those 70s dew points are shunted well off to the east out ahead of that cutoff low. So those 60s dew points down into the Gulf, just patchy 60s up in here. But also you have to remember that the terrain plays a huge role out here as well. The Cap Rock in West Texas or the Texas Panhandle there, higher terrain of eastern Colorado, eastern New Mexico, even southwest Kansas. Uh, you don't need 65 dew points out there to get a robust severe threat because of that higher terrain, that air doesn't hold as much moisture. So a, a 50 dew point in, say, Denver, Colorado, or, you know, Wagon Mound, New Mexico, there in northeast New Mexico, is a per, perhaps the same as maybe a 58, 60, 62 dew point down there in the lower elevations of the plains, Oklahoma City, Dallas, Wichita. 
So you don't need super, super high moisture content, especially surface dew points, to get a robust severe threat in this uh, region of the country because of that higher terrain. That we're still going to maintain those mid 50s to somewhere, sometimes 60s dew points here for the, foreseeable, for, for the foreseeable future out across this region. So even though we have this omega block uh, coming back into, into play, this unfavorable cutoff low sitting there across the southeast, we still be able to get moisture up into the, that high plains region, Colorado, Kansas, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Panhandle, that vicinity. We'll still be able to get moisture there east of the dry line. As far as flow aloft, again, we don't need a lot in these areas. So even though we have at first glance a very unfavorable, unfavorable look to the pattern, we're gonna maintain this fairly zonal flow out across this region, very small perturbations within that flow, little kinks in the flow that will be just enough to initiate thunderstorms here uh, in these spots. The Texas Panhandle, Eastern New Mexico, Southeast Colorado, Southwest Kansas. Just enough flow, 25 to 30 knots, that is definitely on the weaker side. And that's why we're not gonna see maybe a robust tornado threat with this activity. We may tend to see a little bit more of a mix of multi-cells, maybe some transient supercells. Uh, because of the f somewhat marginal deep layer shear, but still, that should be plenty, and this is more than enough across this region, across this higher terrain vicinity, when you have those 55, maybe 60 dew points in place for a severe weather threat. And that's why, why we have multiple days coming up of a severe weather threat. So even though this background pattern may look fairly unfavorable for severe weather, huge ridge in play here across the center portion of the country. We still have just enough flow here in these regions, uh, the southern and central high plains, to increase deep layer shear into at least the marginal category for supercells, just adequate for supercells here across this, ter this territory. With that moisture that is going to remain on a daily basis here, those uh, you know mid 50s to upper 50s dew points, maybe even 60s dew points there across the region, that is going to be a recipe for these daily rounds of storms, some of which will be severe across this region. Now we do see a little bit of an intrusion of maybe this trough starts to slightly break down this ridge, make its way eastward into the center portion of the country. That may help us out a little bit with a more reliable severe weather threat, at least for supercells here across this region. Flow aloft remains fairly weak across these, this area of Colorado into New Mexico and Texas, maybe 25, 30 knots still, even though we do have a little bit more troughiness making its way in, at least on this run of the GFS by the last few days of May. Um, but that cutoff low you see sits there, that's gonna prevent any real robust troughiness from making its way into the center portion of the country for the foreseeable future, at least on these uh, mid-range models. Euro, European model shows much of the same. I'll show you that real quick. This is gonna be the zero Z run from last night and you see a very similar pattern that ridge takes shape but we still have this these subtle perturbations in the flow slightly enhanced flow aloft here across this high plains region new mexico and texas for a uh, severe threat over those uh the next several days that cutoff low also progged by the european model as well there in the southeast so at, if you were just to just step back and take a look you might not think there's a robust severe threat we but we definitely still have the ingredients for a severe weather threat across this high plains region, uh, these higher terrain of eastern New Mexico, west Texas, uh, maybe up into Colorado and Kansas here over the coming days. Let's take a look at today's event just as an example of what we're gonna see on a daily basis coming up. Today we have a slight risk. Again, this is Monday, May 22nd. Slight risk here across the eastern Texas panhandle down into the Texas south plains, northwest Texas. Uh, all hazards on the table. The greatest threat is going to be large hail and damaging wind. There always is gonna be a tornado threat here. When you have you know upper 50s to even 60s dew points in, in the, on this higher terrain of the Texas Panhandle, that Cap Rock region especially, that little bit of higher terrain there, you always have to keep in mind that a tornado or two is possible. It's gonna be on the lower side because we will see, again, that deep layer shear is only marginally favorable for supercells, and we'll generally see a mix of multi-cells and supercells. But if we can get a sustained supercell or two, it will have a tornado threat uh, especially on that higher terrain out here of the Texas Panhandle uh, up into the Oklahoma Panhandle as well. So let's take a quick look. I'm just going to go right to the NAM model and show you what's going to be going on. We do see as we start here this little bit of enhanced flow across this region, mostly zonal flow. But today's threat will rely, as we said, these, are, these features that fuel these events are going to be 
they might not take shape until the night before or the, the morning of an event. And you see this little swirl, this little circulation here in the 500 millibar flow. That is an, a mesoscale convective vortex, or MCV, left over from last night's storm activity in the region. Last night we had a complex of storms move through and dissipate as it moved to the east. And sometimes when that happens, it leaves behind an area of spin called a, a mesoscale convective vortex on the backside. These MCVs act as small scale, low pressure areas. You can see the counterclockwise flow around this MCV. It acts as a little bit of a low pressure area. If we look here, you can see on our 500 millibar map from the SPC mesoanalysis page, you see that, that spin a little bit more clearly, very clear as we go down into the atmosphere. 700 millibars, a little bit of a trough, a very well-defined trough there, uh, actually across southwest Kansas um, from last night's activity. Let's take a look at a product called vorticity. That's the spin in the atmosphere. This is differential vorticity advection. Basically, the change in vorticity across a region and you see it's very much highlighted in this region. Lots of spin in that region where that mesoscale convective vortex is located. If we were to pull up our um, satellite imagery, I do believe we would be able to see uh, that uh, mesoscale convective vortex spinning across this region. Let me zoom in here and show you. Uh, and Let's play this and you can see the swirl in the flow. This is a very, very well-defined mesoscale convective vortex. One of the more, one of the better examples I've seen in recent memory, but you can very clearly see that area of spin. And just ahead of that, usually in the eastern, on the eastern side of that MCV, is where supercell development is likely. In this case, the flow is slightly stronger on the southern flanks of this mesoscale convective vortex. This MCV is going to uh, slowly meander to the east, southeast today. So just ahead of that here, across the far southwest Kansas, Oklahoma Panhandle, northeast Texas Panhandle vicinity, it's where we could see the best chance for maybe a tornado or two today. That tornado threat does extend farther to the south because the flow on the southern flank, as we said, is going to be a little bit stronger in this particular case. Let's go back to our 500 millibar map here and show you. Um, so we go forward in time here just a little bit and you see we do maintain a little bit stronger flow on the south side of that MCV, 25 knots or so um, rounding the base of that MCV, whereas to the east and northeast of that, mainly 5 to 10 knots here at 500 millibar. So slightly stronger deep layer shear to the south of the MCV. So maybe the best overlap of ingredients there would be just ahead on the southeastern flank, the eastern Oklahoma panhandle, far northeast Texas places um, like Hooker, Oklahoma, uh, Canadian Texas, Pampa, Texas, maybe your best bet for robust supercells today. But we will see stronger deep layer shear to the south, and that dry line is going to be in place, so we will have a forcing mechanism farther south for a few severe storms across the southern Texas panhandle into the Texas south plains moving to the east uh, today. So let's go back to our 500 millibar map. You see that that, that um, MCV really just sits there out across southwest Kansas, mostly zonal flow, slightly slight enhancement of flow here as we go towards 0 Z, 7 p.m. this evening, 20 to 30 knots even now. Again, marginally favorable deep layer shear for supercells, going to be mostly a mix of supercells and multicells out there today. As you might expect, because we don't have a strong, real deep digging trough here, traversing the Rockies, we're not going to see a robust low-level response. Perhaps a slight low-level uh, cyclone development out here across eastern New Mexico, southeast Colorado on a daily basis over the coming days because of that slightly enhanced zonal flow traversing the Rockies in this region. So maybe slightly zonal, uh, slightly more backed flow here across the Texas Panhandle. And if we get um, the, this more southeasterly or easterly flow um, going up that Caprock escarpment there in the central Texas Panhandle, that is going to yield some more upslope flow, better chance for storm formation. And that's why we will see, again, another, this is another factor that leads to this daily round, uh, these daily rounds of thunderstorms that will be in play over the coming days. You can see slight low-level cyclone development out here across eastern New Mexico, backed flow across the northern Texas panhandle and the Oklahoma panhandle, southwest Kansas vicinity, uh, which is where our uh, storm formation is most likely ahead of that MCV. Uh, let's go to 700 millibars here, show you that progression of the MCV. Just kind of sits there, meanders slowly off to the east or east-southeast today. Um, not, doesn't move a whole lot. Um, service dew points, let's go ahead and zoom in on those. Let me go to our southern plains sector. You see we start off the day a little bit weak on the weaker side. This is a pretty good init initialization. Let's look at our SPC mesoanalysis to confirm. And you see the those uh, that... Uh, light blue color is about 56 to 60s dew points up into the Texas Panhandle already. 60s dew points um, shunted to the south a little bit there. So Texas South Plains down into central Texas at this point. But those will be brought northward as we have a slight enhancement of the low-level flow 
out across the region thanks to that maybe subtle cyclone development there in eastern New Mexico. We bring those 60s dew points, at least here on the, the NAM run, up into that northeast Texas panhandle, eastern Oklahoma panhandle region uh, ahead of that MCV. Splotchy 60s dew points down there. Those storms kind of eat those dew points um, and we get recovery into tomorrow. So um, a favorable look for severe storms today. Again, a mix of multi-cells and a couple of supercells. Let's take a look here. Take a sounding here from Canadian Texas uh, right ahead of that MCV to give you an idea of the profile. And this is a classic looking profile for severe storms. This particular NAM run is showing a little bit stronger shear, 42 knots or so of effective shear. Decent instability, almost 2,000 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape, 74 over 60 there at the surface. This is maybe a little bit on the cool side, um, so would expect to see a little bit higher temperature dew point spreads, but still well within the, the um, margins we'd like to see for tornadoes. But this hodograph is favorable for severe weather. Weaker low-level shear, not a ton of curvature there in the low-level hodograph. Uh, so large hail is going to be a possibility. Not a super long hodograph, but definitely adequate for the adequate deep layer shear for a supercell or two out across this region. This is your classic looking profile for this region. We're going to have a, a slight increase on a daily basis of the low-level jet as we go into the evening hours. So you see low-level jet diminishes a little bit throughout the day. Then as you go into the evening, we get that nocturnal increase just slightly, maybe 30 knots or so at most as we go towards sunset and just after out there pretty much on a daily basis out across this region. So that will help allow those photographs to enlarge just a little bit going towards sunset. And that may be just enough for maybe a tornado or two on a daily basis here out across this region. So that is going to be what we're looking at for today and very similar look to the next couple of days. This is the day two outlook, slight risk there from the Southeast Texas Panhandle into Northwest Texas, all hazards once again on the table for tomorrow. Um, and then as we go into the next day, would not be surprised to see this upgraded to a slight risk as well for a very similar um, type of threat going into the next few days. And this is what we're going to see for the next several days. And don't be surprised if we see um, lots of these slight and marginal risks over the coming days in these regions. Uh, that is the nature of the threat. Not a super robust threat by any means, maybe the tornado threat on the lower side, but severe weather, great chasing uh, weather, um, nice slow moving supercells, really a good bet over the next couple of days. Wanted to give just a uh, quick example here of what, what the ceiling of these types of events can be. This is from April 14th, 2017. Very robust tornado day out across the western Texas panhandle near the town of Dimmit. Some awesome footage here from the Texas Storm Chasers. I'm a part of that group. Check out Texas Storm Chasers on all these social media uh, feeds that you have. But just an overall very prolific tornado day out here near Dimmit, Texas in the western Texas panhandle. Uh, turned into a wedge tornado as we approached sunset there. Very large uh, tornado there. Uh, this supercell produced multiple tornadoes, including this large one here near Dimmit. But this was on one of these lower risk days. This was the SPC outlook that morning. The day one SPC outlook from that morning, just a slight risk ascending up from south from the western Kansas vicinity down through the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles. Just an, a measly 2% out there. Large hail and damaging winds, the main threats with that activity. Let's go to our setup here. 500 millibars, very similar looking pattern. Ridge here out across the center portion of the country with a trough here across the northwest or west coast, trough here out across the east coast. So east, uh, coast. so this is somewhat of that omega block situation. Not too bad because this is a pretty uh, significant trough making its way in, suppressing that ridge. But down here in Texas, we have mostly zonal flow, 20 to 30 knots of flow, very modest flow aloft. And that maintained itself through much of the day. Maybe a slight enhancement of the flow going into the evening hours, but not much overall. Uh, you might suspect the main threat main severe threat up here in Nebraska, western Kansas, closer to that trough. But down in here across the Texas panhandle, mostly just zonal 20 to 30 knots of flow, very modest flow aloft. So at first glance, you might not think there would be a robust severe threat in place. 700 millibars here, maybe a little bit of a short wave uh, out here across the Texas panhandle. That is similar to maybe your, your MCV in today's event, maybe leftover uh, convectively enhanced um, vorticity maxima aloft. Just a subtle uh, little shortwave there, subtle help from aloft, but not nothing like your deep digging troughs, troughs that we saw in March and April of this year. Down at the surface, 
robust surface load development here in Colorado. Um, we're not going to see that as much here out for the next few days, at least uh, as progged on models, but we do see that nice strong southerly flow here out across the Texas Panhandle, uh, helping to bring that moisture northward around that ridge of high pressure there across the center portion of the country. Quick surface analysis to show you the dew points. They don't need to be all that high out here across this region. We see this station here, Northwest Texas Panhandle, dew point of 57. Uh, Abilene at a 60 dew point. So uh, this was mid to upper 50s dew points. And again, the higher terrain out here, the Western Texas Panhandle on the Cap Rock there in Eastern New Mexico, doesn't mean that we need, we don't need 65 dew points, 70 dew point here to get robust severe weather across this region. This is the evening sounding from Amarillo, Texas on April 14th, 2017. And you can see that it looks pretty similar to what we saw for today's event. What we'll probably see each evening for the next several days out here across the High Plains. Ample instability, about 2,000 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape. Only 71 over 58 at the surface, so 58 degree dew point at first glance might not look like a robust severe weather um, setup there as far as surface moisture goes, but again, the higher terrain, you don't need 65, 70 dew points to get robust severe, we severe weather. 58 is more than adequate. Photographs are uh, in very interesting, as we would say, very similar to what we saw for our um, for today's forecast sounding. Only about 28 knots of effective bulk shear there. So, as similar to today's event, in the next couple of days, it's probably probably a mix of multi cells and super cells, but we, probably some locally higher values as, as we were able to sustain super cells, as we can see from our uh, tornado fest there near Dimmit. But curvature there in the low levels, 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative helicity, definitely there over 200 joules per kilogram of effective storm relative helicity. Some curvature there in the low levels. Um, you can see that it did increase. Here's our 20Z Amarillo sounding. Strong instability, but not quite as much curvature so there. So a modest increase in low a modest increase in low level flow as we went into the evening hours to really enlarge those low level hodographs and help out the tornado genesis process in those. Again, we are going to see a daily, uh, subtle daily increase in the low level jet as we go towards sunset each day. So again, anything like this can happen uh, if we get a profile like this, which is going to be very similar to what we'll see for the next couple of days on a daily basis. So we're going to have that moderate moisture in place. Uh, and we saw a pretty uh, prolific event still throughout the day. Not much uh, indication that this was going to be a significant day. That 2% stayed in place for, for the entire day. Uh, slight risk there. Uh, but we got this out of that setup. A pretty prolific tornado day out across that Dimmit, Texas area. Um, and in a cyclic supercell, had a similar event near Morton, Texas last year. Um, that dusty tornado, as many of you recall, from May 23rd of last year. Uh, that one was associated with a little bit more of a trough aloft, so I didn't want to include that in this video. But I wanted to look at this Dimmit event, and this, as this is a classic, classic mesoscale type day, quote unquote, where you have just very subtle flow, very modest flow aloft, adequate moisture at the surface, and the higher terrain out here of the southern high plains can do wonders. So that's going to do it for this video. Just wanted to discuss the overall threats for the upcoming days and why May is far, far from dead. Eventually, I think we will return to a more active jet stream, more of those deep digging troughs coming in, uh, perhaps to start the month of June. But for now, we're in what I call mesoscale season. These events that are where you have subtle, modest flow aloft, 20, 30, 35 knots of flow aloft, uh, of southwest flow aloft, little perturbations within the flow, but these events are fueled very much by the higher terrain, as well as some of the, those more mesoscale or smaller scale features, outflow boundaries from previous days convection, MCVs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So keep an eye out. The tornado threat over the coming days may not be super, super robust, but there, but as we saw here from these, uh, from this Dimmit day, for example, these, these more mesoscale days can work some magic, Texas Panhandle, cap rock magic, as it's colloquially called in the storm chase community. Uh, so keep an eye out if we can get sustained supercells every day, given adequate moisture um, and the subtle flow aloft supercell storm mode expected a lot of the time. A tornado or two is definitely possible. Uh, I would not be surprised. I would actually probably bet some money that we were, go we were going to see a really photogenic uh, tornado event out here at some point. Uh, storm chasers, storm chasers just have to be there, uh, and it's going to be. Uh, this is the time where actual forecasters shine. The, the convective allowing models are not going to do a great job with these types of events, um, so you're really going to have to use your forecasting skills uh, to figure out the best areas for a supercell and tornado threat each day. 
So with that, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.